Okay, can you switch that off now? I will put the trailer or should I not oh, put okay. it? Okay, trailer is fine, yeah. Then just yeah. do it and we allow people now to enter. Yeah. And is YouTube is now there, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Copy streaming link. And then we start in a moment. Just put this in the So, oh, I think we can start. A very warm welcome to all our participants here to our webinar, which is a big webinar, a big online event, um, which is about the status of wind power around the world. And it's my great pleasure that we have experts from all the major wind markets who will present um, now and later today in the second session, the status of their home countries, of their uh, home markets. Before we start and before I would request the president of World Wind Energy Association, Peter Ray, to say a few welcome words. Let me give you some technical information. This is an, a public event, which means that it is not only the information is not only available here, uh, in Zoom, so it's also broadcasted live on YouTube. It's also recorded and later will be made available through the normal social media channels. So if you say something, if you raise your voice, if you also type something in the chat, then be aware that that is accessible in principle for everyone. Um, let me also request everyone to stay muted until you are requested to speak. Um, for those of you having any questions to the speakers, or even also if you have comments, please use the chat window, the chat function here. Um, and as far as time allows, we will then address the speakers to answer those questions. And if time allows, we may also request the, panel, the, the people to speak and address the speaker directly. Yeah, before I hand over, Please um, also let me um, say thank you to everyone already now at this point of time. Uh, of course, thank you to all our experts, to our members from around the world who contribute now the first hand information about wind power status around the world. Um, of course, thank you to um, also our supporters, in particular German Profic, who has uh, Profic Ventus. Uh, who has been supporting, is a partner of the webinar series and allows us to hold these webinars for free. Um, please also feel invited, if you like our webinars, 
you can support us by joining WWEA by going to our website and also of course those companies who would like to increase their international visibility by becoming a sponsor. Now let me hand over to our president Peter Ray who will in officially welcome you to this webinar. I think Peter, Peter, I, think Peter I think Peter lost the connection. Yeah, Peter just wrote me that he's not allowed to unmute if you can if you check. No, he's not in the room. I think the internet. Okay. Went off. Then in that case, I would hand over directly uh, to you, Sean. Sean Daniel Pitelou, who is uh, working with us with the World Wind Energy Association here from Bonn, and he's gathering the statistics, the global uh, wind power statistics. And Sean, then I request you to take over and present the wind market overview as of end of 2020. Thank you, Stefan, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, yes, I will uh, today present a little bit an overview of what is the market for wind energy, a global wind market. I will not touch any country in particular because uh, we will have today uh, many speakers from the, from the major markets, but I will just try to give you an overview of where we are uh, by the end of 2020. So in this chart here, you can see the, how wind energy has grown from the very beginning, from the 1980s with only eight megawatts to, to today that we just have 744,000 megawatts. So you can see here how wind has grown during the last decades. Uh, and according to our estimations, uh, wind power worldwide produce around 1300 terawatt hours of electricity uh, in, by, um, in 2020. And uh, this is a, and estimately roughly a share of 6% of the global total electricity consumption or generation. Uh, so in terms of uh, install capacity of wind power, uh, 2020 we reached seven, at least 744,000 megawatts. So that, that's an increase of almost 93,000 megawatts. We can see here, we have a very stable increase of growth rates during the last year, but this year was very special. Or last year was very special. So in terms of new install capacity, as I mentioned, 93 gigawatts of new installations worldwide. You can see here compared to the previous year where we have 50, 52, 61 previous year, which was already uh, growing. Uh, this year was very special and we reached almost 100 gigas of new installations worldwide. So in terms of uh, the top, top countries, top markets, uh, as, as in previous year, China is dominating the market for new installations and global installations with uh, 52 gigas of new installations. Uh, you can see here also US, uh, very good growth. Uh, some European countries like Spain uh, that have starting again to have a, a market for wind after ma many years of uh, almost no installations. Uh, France is also very good. Uh, also from Latin America, Brazil having good installations. And you can see here also in the rest of the world, it's already 14 new gigas of installations. So if we, in terms of regions, you can see here in Africa, last year was not very good for Africa after having continuous growth year by year. In 2020, we saw a decrease in new installations, and mainly Morocco have uh, good installations last year. So Africa is almost reaching the nine gigas of new installation of total installations by 2020. In Asia Pacific, uh, you can see here, of course, the, the growth of China last year. You can see here the new installation, the total installations is almost 360 gigas of, of wind power. And uh, you see here the huge increase in terms of new installations, mainly as I mentioned, dominated or if you if you see here, 52 gigas are only from China. So that's a, that's a huge number. In Europe, very stable market. The last years, uh, you can see here that the new installations are quite stable, let's say. Uh, the number that probably is missing here is Germany, but we'll hear more uh, later today. So in terms of total install capacity, uh, Europe is reaching the 213 gigas of wind power. So in Latin America, 
uh, we saw a very good number last year with 5.2 gigas of new installations uh, after very stable lead years uh, in the past. Uh, so Latin America is reaching the 37 uh, gigawatts, uh, gigawatts of uh, wind power. So market is mainly dominated, but of course Brazil, uh, but also some other countries like Chile is having also very good numbers. And finally, North America, uh, after also quite stable previous years, we saw a huge increase in numbers in 2020. Uh, and here, uh, North America is reaching the 140 gigas of total wind capacity. So in general, um, we saw a very good year. We hope uh, it continues like this. So in the coming two years, two and a half years, we can reach the one 1,000 uh, gigawatts of total wind power. Uh, let's see new markets like uh, Vietnam, for example, and also, East, I mean, Southeast Asia, there are a few new markets that is, have been growing in the last years. We hope also countries or regions that were increasing in the past, uh, like uh, South Africa, for example. Also, we have new markets like Russia. We will have a, today another speaker talking about Russia, but we hope that these new markets also are coming up and then bringing the numbers up. And of course, we hope that China continues the same growth. So we will have some very high numbers again for, for wind power. So that that's all for today. Uh, if you have any question about the figures, the general figures that we publish on our website, you can just drop me an email. Uh, yeah, and hopefully in the next, uh, in the next uh, webinar, uh, I will be able to talk a little bit more about specific markets, smaller markets, uh, maybe immature markets, let's say, uh, that we will have more information also from them. So that's also, uh, that's all from me. Uh, I go back to you, Stefan. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. I think that was indeed uh, impressive, um, the growth that uh, most of us did not expect. I remember that we had uh, a year ago um, our online meeting that was actually the first um, after we st this this pandemic situation started and we had to stop all our offline activities. So a year ago, uh, nobody really knew what would be the impact of COVID-19 on the wind power sector. We had a, a market overview webinar in autumn last year and at that time still most markets were um, kind of looked as if uh, there was there were delays in projects but um, mainly due to of course the two largest market china and us the year 2020 brought a new record in wind power installations and that is of course uh, something that uh, we hope will continue in the years to come now peter ray is again with us peter i'm very pleased to have you here and i would request you to um, now welcome our participants after Sean has already introduced the record installation numbers of the year 2020. Peter. Well, thank you very much, Stefan, and I'm sorry for the problem. I hope that I can be now heard, uh, but I, I was just getting a uh, report that the uh, I couldn't be allowed uh, to get in. Uh, can you hear me now? Thank you very much. Okay, well, a, welcome, a warm welcome to all the participants uh, in this webinar. It's a further webinar by the World Wind Energy Association to try to extend the knowledge and the interest in the development of the wind industry and in general, uh, in general the development of renewable energy. One of the things I think that's important for us to bear in mind is that uh, not only do we need to develop uh, renewable energy because of the impending uh, effects of climate change, and I think probably now that doesn't need much emphasis, but in any event, the world needs to develop as a sustainable entity. The day when Mars may be able to provide us with uh, energy that we need is probably still a long way off, even though we've had people landing uh, all, uh, equipment on Mars and uh, we'll be getting stories back. But uh, I think we need to concentrate not only on climate change, but on sustainability. And in regard to that, 
with regard to that, the uh, rate of growth is an important part because unless uh, we can achieve a, an adequate rate of growth, we won't achieve the impact that's necessary to offset climate change uh, and to reduce uh, the rate of climate change. And what we need to do is to ensure that the way in which renewable energy can be developed is financed. One of the questions uh, which arises uh, as the world recovers from the pandemic is not only uh, the aspects of the pandemic itself and its impact on countries, but the impact that it's had on the economies of the world and whether the uh, availability of finance will be sufficient. And if not, then what measures can we take and what approaches should be taken to governments of the world to ensure that there is an adequate flow of finance available to the development of the wind industry and of uh, renewable energy generally. The role of finance is therefore something that I think uh, needs some attention and perhaps we can discuss that during the webinar. Uh, there's also the question of competition. Uh, competition from other renewable I think we need to go into because what I think most of us would agree is that we need all of the renewables to achieve the very best results that we uh, need for uh, achieving the 2050 target and uh, I think that uh, the other renewables will all play their part. Wind of course is one of the strongest and one of the uh, most readily developed, and uh, but it does need uh, support uh, from uh, other sources, and we'll be discussing uh, no doubt something to do with that. Uh, so far as coal and gas uh, and uh, nuclear are concerned, I don't think we need to discuss that in any detail, except to say that uh, it's probably time to consider a little bit about nuclear with the uh, proposals uh, for some of the new types of nuclear um, equipment uh, technology to uh, uh, play a part in, and uh, it would be interesting to have any uh, uh, suggestions in relation to that. Uh, of course, uh, basic nuclear is way, way too expensive to ever be considered to be uh, competitive, and Hinkley Point and uh, some of the other in the UK and some of the others which are way over budget and way over uh, time are proof of the problems of uh, developing nuclear energy at the moment. One of the issues that I think is important is the role in relation to developing countries. How can we assist uh, in the developed countries to ensure that the developing countries are able to play their part in uh, the establishment of uh, renewable energy. They are entitled, of course, uh, to electricity. Uh, and the people who live in the developing world uh, need electricity. The question is, how can it be, best can it be provided? And whose responsibility should it be? Is the more needed by way of uh, an international approach to that issue is another question that we might uh, uh, look at today. Uh, so, in summary, we've got a significant uh, amount of statistics to provide. We've got comments from a number of expert speakers, and uh, that's an important part of what we're doing with the World Wind Energy Association is bringing speakers together to be heard and to be questioned uh, uh, in relation to their contribution that they can make to the, some knowledge of the industry and of the world uh, of renewable energy and of energy uh, requirements. So with a warm welcome to all of those who are participating, a particular welcome to also to those who will be uh, speaking. I hand uh, now back to Stefan to introduce the uh, remainder of the program. Thank you very much, Stefan, for what you do in organising these and John uh, as well in organising the webinars. I think they've been very successful and I trust that this one will keep up the tradition which has been established already. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter, for your welcome and uh, yeah, greetings to Australia. 
Uh, we're quite far away from each other, but uh, it's very nice to see that these, uh, this kind of uh, collaboration still works well across the globe. And we've learned a lot, actually, the last uh, 12 months, how we can continue uh, our work without actually physically meeting. So um, let me now see, actually, our first speaker would be from Australia, but I don't see that Andrew Bray is yet with us here. Um, if I'm wrong, please, Andrew, raise your voice or somehow raise your, your hand or let us know. Um, as Andrew seems not with us, so it might be a technical problem. I would uh, go uh, ahead with the first speaker from Asia, uh, and that is Mr. Yu Guiyong from the Chinese Wind Energy Association, who speaks on behalf of Mr. Xin Haiyan. Um, who is the Secretary General of the Chinese Wind Energy Association and the Vice President of the World Wind Energy Association. Now, Mr. Yu, you are the expert at the Chinese Wind Energy Association for gathering the statistics for China. China had an impressive year in 2020, even more, I think, than, that, than many optimistic uh, experts had expected. And uh, now I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, at first, a warm welcome to Beijing. Then now the floor is yours. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks for your introduction. And I'm very happy to present here today and uh, to join this webinar on behalf of uh, Chinese Wind and Association. And I'm very happy to share with you some status and our targets for our wind market. <clears throat> Uh, so first, I would like to share with you what happened last year. Uh, as, as everybody knows, we have uh, the best records in history for the last year. And uh, in 2020, we have about uh, 52 gigawatts has been installed, added, I mean, new added. But it makes the total uh, uh, installation reached to 288 gigawatts. Uh, anyway, this figure is to be confirmed. Um, I think we could have the final one uh, by the end of this April. So uh, uh, as everybody in history, and uh, also we have the biggest one, uh, the biggest capacity uh, to connect it in to the grid. It's about uh, 72 gigawatts. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> also in last year, we also achieved uh, a very, uh, very good records uh, for the offshore wind. And uh, for, for the offshore wind, we have about uh, four, four gigawatts uh, new, newly added. So that makes the cumulative ins installation is about uh, 11 for the offshore wind. <clears throat> so this makes the whole shy of wind installation, installation capacity in all resources rated to about 13% in last year. Uh, and also we can see we still have very big percentage of fossil fuels. It's uh, uh, as high as about 73%. But anyway, we're just changing the whole structures. And uh, also we can see the proportion of wind power electricity in the whole electricity demand is about uh, 6% in last year. That's much the same with the global status, uh, 6%. And um, <clears throat> it's average percentage, you know. Uh, so for the faster developing country uh, fast developing market we know it's not it's still relatively low it's slow so we could accelerate and also <clears throat> for this uh, for last year we also see the turbine technology development in terms of the a, a, a LCOE and uh, both in onshore and offshore wind so we can see we have a very draft uh, decrease uh, for the cost. Uh, onshore wind, 
and we get parity by this end of the year. Uh, why we can do that? That's because we have a very prominent and a very special background that because the last year, China set the goal for carbon neutrality by 2060. So Chinese president has announced a, a very ambitious climate target to achieve the carbon peak and the carbon neutrality by 2030 and 2060 respectively. So China aims to hive the carbon diagnosis emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. And to achieve these targets, we have to add more uh, uh, renewable energies and clean energies, mainly for wind power and uh, solar power. So last year at the CWP, uh, last December, uh, Chinese Wind Energy Association uh, together with the other 400 wind power companies signed a joint declaration call for annual wind power capacity added to 50 to 60 gigawatts to help China reach carbon neutrality by 60, 2060. That means we should have at least a uh, annual installation about 50 gigawatts for the next five year period. That means from 2021 to 2025. And at least 60 gigawatts after 2025. And we have to reach at least 800 gigawatts by 2030 and 3,000 gigawatts by 2060. So that's the basis line for Chinese, for China to reach the carbon neutrality targets. To first of all, we have to purify, we have to clean and clarify the, 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 the electricity power system. And that's the basis for the whole society's carbon neutrality targets. So for the outlook of the Chinese uh, wind market capacity, we can see uh, with this big background, uh, we have to cite a very ambitious, the 14th five-year plan and the next 40 years of plan. And uh, we can see it's about uh, by 2050, we should reach at least uh, uh, 2000 gigawatts for wind power only. And uh, together with the other uh, thermal gas, nuclear, solar, and uh, hydro. So uh, during the post subsidy era, uh, we have big targets and we still have very big challenges. We have to reduce the cost. We have to strengthen our supply chain. We have to accelerate digital transformations and improve international cooperation because we have to balance the whole industry chain to get a balancing supply chain. But basically, a green power consumption market is very essential to the increase of wind power in China and to get to reach the targets of carbon neutrality. So that's what's happening in China and our uh, status here and our perspectives. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, I think, a very impressive um, presentation of what the status is in China. Indeed, when we hear about uh, 50 gigawatt of annual capacity additions for the next years to come, um, then you have already reached in the year 2020. Um, if I just may ask you now, you have presented this. This is the proposal by the Chinese wind industry. Has it already been those those targets? Has it already reached the political level? So has the government already taken uh, that proposal or what? what is the status? Is that still under discussion? Um, I think it's not officially accepted by the uh, by the government for now so far, but I think it's going to be released uh, for, uh, together with the 14th five year plan for the whole country, and it's much the same with our targets. So you, what you are aware of is that those uh, proposals will be included in the next five years plan. Yes. 
Well, congratulations for everything that you have achieved. Uh, indeed, I remember that the first time we had our World Bank conference in Beijing in 2004, China had an installed capacity of around half gigawatt. So that's really been a fantastic journey together with you and see how the Chinese wind sector grew and became stronger and stronger is now indeed uh, leading the world. Thank you so much with this. Um, I would uh, then kind of go back time wise to uh, Australia um, and invite our next speaker. It's my great pleasure that we have now Andrew Bray with us. Andrew, you are the uh, chair uh, chairing the RE Alliance, the Renewable Energy Alliance, which was just created recently out of the Australian Wind Alliance. Uh, which is the body which represents the interests of the Australian wind sector. Uh, now, obviously, not only looking for uh, wind, but also for renewables in general. Australia, another very interesting country, because the growth of renewables is quite impressive. Uh, I mean, of course, considering the size of the, the population, and there's a very strong growth that is coming from the people, from the communities and the citizens, um, with at the moment a federal government not so supportive and we're now very curious to hear from Australia how wind power has developed uh, in particular in the year 2020. Andrew, a warm welcome to Australia and the floor is yours. Thank you very much Stefan and um, my apologies everyone, I clearly got the, <clears throat> uh, got the time zone wrong. I was waiting for another hour and a bit before I logged on. So um, my apologies. But Time switches between summer and daylight savings and not, I think, is a bit challenging for all of us. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, now, I'll just work out how I can share my screen with you all. Uh, you're not able to see my screen yet. Not yet. <clears throat> Uh, okay. mm. Not what I was expecting, but that's all right. Now um, it's coming. Okay. Excellent. Um, so you can just see the, the slides. There's not the, the extra notes there. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. My apologies. I'll just try that one again. So indeed, Australia has a very special role. If in the meantime, I may just comment on this because Australia has huge renewable resources, but also some coal resources, as we know. So it is really affected by this global transition to renewables away from um, coal and other fossil resources. And I see that now, I think, can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you, Stefan. Very good. My we are now ready to go. Um, so yes, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak um, uh, about wind in Australia over the last year. It was only in October we, we spoke last time, but um, but even in that time, a lot has happened in Australia. And, um, and I was, I'll have some figures shortly on some of our capacity additions in recent times. And I was feeling pretty impressed with them um, until I logged on after the uh, Chinese presentation and um, China's putting as much wind energy in in one year as we have in electricity generation in the country. So it puts it in perspective. Uh, okay. Um, so yes, as Stefan um, kindly mentioned, we, uh, for the first seven years of our life, were uh, the Australian Wind Alliance. Uh, but we've now rebranded um, as Realliance or Renewable Energy Alliance. Um, and essentially our focus is um, to work in the regions where the um, work in the regions where the, the uh, renewable energy is being installed uh, because we see that social license uh, is one of the one of the key barriers potentially one of the key barriers to, to roll out of renewable energy here uh, and I'll be mentioning uh, renewable energy zones um, a bit down the track um, 
but essentially we wanted to be able to work in a space where we're talking to the solar industry, to the wind industry, to the battery and storage, even pumped hydro storage industries uh, and transmission about, uh, about good um, community engagement and community benefit sharing programs. Uh, so that's, that will be the focus of our work uh, going forward. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, last year was um, was a record for installed capacity in Australia um, by by quite a considerable margin, and the, uh, that was building again on uh, 2019, which was also a record. Um, <clears throat> so the numbers there uh, are not enormous, um, but but last year there was uh, over a gigawatt of wind uh, installed and fully commissioned here. In Australia, um, and that takes uh, the share wind power share of our annual generation to around ten percent. Uh, so that's that's a bit of a milestone in itself, uh, and it's also uh, it's it accounts for about thirty five percent of renewable generation in Australia. So uh, so more than um, rooftop solar uh, and hydro. Um, but it's worth noting that uh, there, while there was a thousand megawatts um, commissioned last year, there's a further four thousand megawatts uh, actually on the way, uh, and a lot of that <clears throat> so it's either un under construction or it's committed uh, to to begin uh, as committed in a financial sense. Uh, but when it says under construction, um, I'll talk a bit in a second about the issues we have with. Um, with grid access, which I'm sure is, is you know, a common theme among many countries. But we actually have a number of wind farms that are sitting there you know, um, in the paddocks already with the turbines all fully constructed. Uh, and the grid operator is, is taking months uh, to, to get to commission these, pro, um, these projects and actually connect them to the grid. Uh, so, in fact, it could be that that actually this, you know, maybe 2000 megawatts of that is actually pretty much constructed and is just being um, added into the grid. So, that, so it could happen quite quickly in 2021. Um, and as I mentioned, wind uh, is around about 10%. Um, in, in Australia, the next largest source of um, of renewable energy is small scale solar, rooftop solar. We, we have something like 2 million solar roofs uh, in Australia, which is, I'm not sure what proportion of households it is, but it, it's, uh, it's very high. Um, uh, so hydro comes next and then large scale solar uh, a bit below that. So even in a place, you know, as, as sunny as Australia, wind is still um, at the moment, the most uh, prevalent form of renewable energy. Um, so going forward to, um, to look at, at what um, the, the future sort of looks like here, really the key, the key barrier is uh, simply connecting to the network. Um, our our, generation, our um, transmission network here has really been based around um, a handful of coal regions. Uh, and the transmission lines run from the coal, coal regions in the Latrobe Valley, the Hunter Valley, um, and they run into the main demand centres into the, uh, the capital cities. Uh, but now the wind and solar farms are being placed all over the countryside, particularly solar farms. Um, you can pretty much put them anywhere where the sun's shining. Um, so we've reached, we've now reached the point where we can plug into the existing transmission and new really significant lines, uh, new transmission lines need to be built. Um, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of kilometres of them. Uh, and that's uh, because of the federal government resistance to, um, uh, to really taking the renewable transition seriously in recent years, that work, which should have started, you know, five, 10 years ago, um, is only really starting in earnest now. So we've got a lot of catching up to do um, to be able to, to plug in these extra renewables as they come online. 
Uh, the state governments, while the federal government has been lagging, the state governments really have been stepping up. Um, and look, it's an interesting, um, many of you live in uh, federally, you know, federated countries. Um, Australia is one of those. We have a federal government, but the states have a number of uh, responsibilities. And one of those is energy, um, is electricity provision. Um, while the federal government was active in this space, uh, they could coordinate a lot of them across the, the states and there was a national electricity market. There is a national electricity market, um, but the state governments are having to step in and say, well, if the federal government won't build transmission, if they won't plan renewable energy zones in this area, then we will step up and do it ourselves. Uh, so they really are being very proactive. They're legislating new programs. They're taking it very seriously and moving on um, quite a bit. Uh, and the uh, new development is being concentrated in renewable energy zones. So one, one we do actually have a really strong direction uh, from the Australian energy market operator. And they... Um, they've put together a, a plan called an integrated system plan and they've just updated it again last year and that sets out um, around 30 renewable energy zones up and down the east coast of australia that they they can target for um for you know good wind and solar and or solar resources uh and and there will be transmission lines planned going out to those and a number of those transmission projects are now progressing um, from our point of view, we are, um, uh, we are taking, taking quite an interest in those renewable energy zones because from the social licence point of view, what it's going to look like for a lot of these, these regions is suddenly a great, you know, um, onslaught of wind and solar projects might turn up in, in their backyard and transmission lines as well. Uh, and unless, unless industry engages well, uh, shares benefits with the community, um, delivers jobs, um, that the, the acceptance of those projects is going to be in real jeopardy. So there's quite a lot of work to be done there. Uh, another interesting trend is, is that we have a very large pipeline of large scale battery projects, and it's something like um, three to 4,000 megawatts. So ne nearly three to 4,000 gigawatts of battery projects proposed in Australia, which is, um, which I, correct me if anyone on the call could correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, but I think that's, that's quite, um, quite a lot by, by world standards. Um, a lot of those ones are being looked at, not so much to be paired with wind and or solar farms, um, but they're being placed next to coal plants, some of which are retiring. Um, uh, because that's where the strong part of the grid is, and that's where the that's where the batteries can be of most benefit. So we're seeing um, uh, we're seeing plans for for new batteries to go in at um, uh, a lot of the coal plants, but also to um, increase um, increase the carrying capacity of transmission lines, which is very interesting. So that's that's really bodes quite well for the development of renewables, and and may well. Um, keep new development coming along um, until the new transmission lines are built. Uh, the final thing I mentioned is that, um, as with many other countries, our we still get 65% or so of our generation from coal, which is a huge amount, and it's the main one of the main reasons why Australia continues to be one of the worst emitters on the planet. Um, but the because of the that um, increase in wind and solar that's just come in in the last year or two, wholesale prices have decreased quite steeply, uh, particularly in the middle of the day where all that um, solar um, generation comes in. Uh, and we're getting a lot of negative pricing um, episodes as well. And that's really hurting the coal plants. Many of the older ones can't cycle up and down. Um, so... Um, so yeah, it, it's sort of been inching down 67, 66%, 65%, but, um, but now there's a few projects which are now looking quite like they'll, uh, they'll sort of go in a bit of a rush. So it may be that in the next year or two, uh, we see 
quite a quite a significant rebalancing in the percentages that renewables provides against coal. Uh, so that's that's uh, all I'd like to present for now. But um, I'm happy to take any uh, questions that anyone has if I've um, left enough time, Stefan. Thank you so much um, and for this uh, presentation of where Australia stands. And indeed, you mentioned that Australia is quite unique in terms of the uh, large scale battery capacity. That's also my perception. And I know, of course, there's a lot of discussion now going on on what will be the, the mid or short, mid long term uh, storage strategy for uh, renewables. And uh, of course, now many people point at Australia and saying that, uh, yeah, that's the way to go. Of course, there's always a discussion now about hydrogen versus batteries. I think it's mm -hmm. great to see that Australia is um, trying this battery approach on a, on a large scale because the world uh, will learn a lot from the experience that you're doing there. And it's quite, uh, I think, uh, remarkable that this a lot of this is happening just on a market uh, basis based on, on what the people and the government, the um, uh, enterprises and the citizens do invest in. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Um, then I would uh, say again, thank you and uh, have a nice evening. And please have a look whether there is any uh, additional questions coming up in the chat. Uh, thanks so much, Andrew. Uh, and then we again travel more to the north. And it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Chuichi Arakawa from Japan, from Tokyo. Um, assuming you're based in Tokyo at this point of time. Um, Chuichi, my great pleasure to welcome you here. Um, you are a former, a professor emeritus at the uh, University of Tokyo. Um, and now you are a designated professor at Kyoto University. So this is your kind of professional affiliation. In addition to that, you're representing the Japan Wind Energy Association. And uh, since many years, you have been on the board as the vice president of the World Wind Energy Association, um, one of the leading experts uh, for wind power, in particular offshore wind in Japan. And now it's a great honor having you uh, sharing with us the latest developments of wind power in Japan. Chuichi. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, now, I would like to move to my slide. I'd like to check. And I dropped it. Yes, and mm. it's okay now. Now, hello. Yeah. Is it? Can you see my slide? Not yet, no. Not yet. Not yet. Mm. Sean. Half, oh, half year ago, we made mistake to show my slide. So it's better for me to use um, my previous slide I have already sent to you. Sean, we, can you do that? Yes, coming soon. Yeah, please uh, prepare my slide in your side. Uh, uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, please use, uh, yes, thank you. Now, it's my great pleasure to explain Japanese status of wind power generation this year. Next slide, please. Yes. I explain uh, the Japanese status comparing with uh, international one. Now, as Jan, Jan has already explained, our world wind power capacity becomes oh, 744 gigawatt, but in Japan, uh, total accumulation is just four gigawatt. You can see uh, in the uh, uh, figures uh, of the uh, right, left hand side. Yes, I think uh, our position Japan is located uh, at the 20s, maybe 20s ranking in the world. I'm sorry, but we are eager to develop offshore wind available uh, in the large 
uh, economic exclusive zone of ocean. Uh, the government has continued to design, designate offshore wind promotion area. Yes, you can see at first, I'd like to explain the uh, wind power capacity of onshore. Uh, you can see our total capacity this year is four, around four gigawatt. You can see the sun increase uh, year by year, uh, but this figure shows uh, wind power for onshore. It means now a total capacity for onshore is growing to 4.4 gigawatt now. I think, I imagine the total amount on onshore in Japan will be increased to uh, 10 gigawatt at, the, at most, or something like that. Anyway, 10 gigawatt. But uh, later, it is very difficult for us to develop wind power for onshore style because we have the small island and we have strong some social acceptance problem. So we need to develop offshore wind in parallel with onshore one. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, yes, I have already explained the beautiful uh, floating offshore wind projects uh, pictures. Uh, this is the first one uh, in Japan. Uh, it's located in Nagasaki Prefecture. Of course, the project has already completed and, it, and this, this turbine uh, still works uh, for, other, uh, for providing electricity to small city in Nagasaki area. Uh, now we are calling the some uh, project uh, sector for extending the size. It means this project will be one candidate of the auction for the general sea area, uh, which I will explain later. Okay, anyway, this is a successful project uh, organized by Ministry of Environment of Japan. Next slide, please. Uh, you can remember well that Fukushima project after uh, our great Eastern Japan earthquakes. Of course, now 10 years has passed since we had a big disaster of the earthquake. And after the disaster, the uh, Ministry of e Economy, Trade, Industry, METI, organized big projects of uh, floating offshore in Fukushima area. Four turbine, uh, three turbines, and with one another floater for met mast, something like that. Uh, but now, last, uh, last year, the government has decided that all turbines will be removed. It is our great pity, but I can say that they have the good profits in the experiment test project, but uh, the, a kind of owner, uh, wind sector for Fukushima project uh, doesn't like to keep this floaters for the following big size of offshore wind. So finally the government has decided to stop this project. Uh, next slide, please. And you can see another beautiful slide of floating offshore uh, turbines in Fukushima area. One floating substation, another one two megawatt uh, turbines, which does work well. Next slide, please. The another seven megawatt sub, uh, sub, sub massive uh, V-shaped three columns floater. This turbine didn't work well because uh, MHI uh, put the first uh, innovative turbines to this, to this floater. Of course, he, uh, it's very difficult to check the reliability as a fast turbines. So uh, anyway, they decided to uh, remove uh, all turbines. It is my private, uh, my great pity to stop 
all of these innovative uh, projects. Next slide, please. But of course, uh, last my presentation half year ago, I um, introduced some breaking news for uh, uh, wind power, renewable energy, and our energy uh, milestones in Japan. At first, METI, uh, Minister of METI, uh, follows a proposal by uh, Japan Wind Power Association, Wind Sector Group, for a future target of offshore wind. Yes, 10 gigawatt by 2030, 30 and 45 gigawatt by 2040. It's a great. But next slide, please. Ne yes. Uh, furthermore, uh, half month, half year ago, new prime minister, Mr. Suga, has declared at that time uh, that we will increase greenhouse gas to zero by 2050, so-called green uh, neutral. Uh, so we are very surprised to know this proposal by our prime minister. Now, next slide, please. The government, our government also makes strong efforts to extend this uh, declaration of carbon neutral with offshore wind, something like that. Now, I'd like to explain the formal document, many governmental formal documents uh, in the following. Uh, you can see this figure. Uh, in 2030, uh, renewable energy uh, covers 22 to 24% for all electricity. As I have already explained, but wind is only 1.7%. It's very, very small. So uh, I continue to push uh, the government to accept big size of wind power, offshore wind power. But even now, the government keeps this uh, target. But of course, uh, now, uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, the government also has uh, uh, tried to make new sense for developing uh, renewable energy. Uh, so this figure shows the same explanation as the uh, former ones. Next slide, please. In, uh, for uh, offshore wind, we have so many possibilities, something like in the map. In, in the north, Hokkaido and Tohoku, we have the big possibility for uh, offshore wind. And uh, they can provide us electricity to 30 to 45 gigawatts by 2040 and something like that. Exactly, we have the possibility to extend uh, offshore wind. Next slide, please. Yes, of course, the government also explains uh, some, uh, some uh, barrier to uh, grow up uh, offshore wind, including onshore wind. Uh, we have the, some electricity uh, grid problem we need the government should uh, reinforce a long-term grid uh, systems. Uh, you may know well that we have the two uh, electric system in the north east part is organized by electricity 50 hertz, in another one 60 hertz. And furthermore, we have the independent electricity uh, company uh, as 10 units. Anyway, the government should uh, uh, concentrate each facilities and they should uh, connect each other. Next slide. Yes, now the government, the government explains a future target to 2050 in the right hand side. Uh, you can see uh, the decarbonized electric sources. Uh, the, government, the government also says 
the all of electricity will come from uh, new styles. But you can see uh, the new ores comes fr from uh, covers fifty percent. Next, next word nuclear. Nuclear will cover thirty or forty percent. It's a big problem. Even now, the government uh, keeps uh, renewable energy as well as uh, nuclear power as well as renewables for the target to 2050, big uh, amount. Certainly, total uh, carbon neutral means to uh, be free from uh, carbon dioxide. So nuclear power plant has a possibility to do it. So it means the government uh, keeps uh, each position, renewable energy and nuclear power for a future green uh, uh, carbon neutralization. It's a big problem. Okay, next slide, please. This is a, another formal document for offshore wind from the government. You can see uh, exact uh, milestones for the uh, uh, offshore wind to uh, 2030. Now we have three uh, zones for promoting one. Uh, one of them is at Nagasaki. Uh, I have already explained for uh, floating offshore. Another three area is Akita Prefecture and Nagasaki Prefecture. Now, furthermore, we continue uh, to uh, select the next zone, so-called promotion zone, uh, another Akita uh, area, and uh, Aomori 2 area, and finally, one more Nagasaki area. Now, we have around eight zones for exact uh, developing offshore wind in Japan. No, uh, I'm also a member to committee uh, of the committee to uh, discuss the exact process of offshore wind uh, in local area, especially Aomori Prefecture. Okay, next slide, please. Now, uh, the so many programs in TV and the newspapers or for developing offshore wind. Uh, so uh, people understand the possibility of the wind power for uh, total uh, uh, big, uh, total, what shall I say, a possibility uh, to uh, carbon neutral. And uh, furthermore, uh, so young generation uh, cooperate with us to develop uh, these uh, offshore wind and onshore wind. But in this case, we need to have collaboration with international sector manufacturer for rapid development and good communication with local people, especially such as visionary. We need to escape from so-called social acceptance problem in offshore wind. Next slide. Yes, finally, uh, it's a conclusion. Now, uh, Japan, Japanese government also started the scheme of promotion area of offshore wind. Furthermore, uh, they declared energy policy toward net zero greenhouse gas emissions. But uh, we, we have some possibility uh, to extend nuclear power again for the carbon neutral in Japan, if we have some uh, slow speed of uh, developing uh, another renewable energy. So anyway, please expect future offshore wind power in Japan and cooperate with us. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Juichi. That was very interesting to hear from Japan and uh, about the indeed ambitious plans in particular related to offshore wind. But of course, we hope that uh, the ambitions are becoming a bit 
bigger than they are at this point of time. I know that you're working very hard. Uh, we wish you a, a lot of uh, success for that work. And as you refer to, um, of course, the, the question of social acceptance, which I think is quite low in the case of nuclear power, um, at least the service that we've been uh, um, told by mm -hmm. Japanese colleagues. We are at the moment also doing a, a survey on uh, community energy in Japan and the share of women in community energy. Let me just uh, mention that comparing uh, Germany and uh, um, Japan. And that is very interesting to see um, the, the role of women and how they are in some cases drivers of this movement towards uh, renewable energy, of course. We hope that that will also help to increase the support of the citizens for uh, wind energy in general. Um, so uh, again, a great thank you. And uh, um, please, again, please stay with us in case that some there are some questions uh, coming up. Um, uh, then I have the pleasure to invite our next speaker. And I'm just wondering because Professor Son from Korea, he has uh, told us that he would be a little bit late. So do we have uh, Professor Son um, already with us? And uh, so we change a little bit the order. Ah, there he is just arriving. Um, so we would uh, now be, I think, able to, yeah, start or continue right away. Uh, Professor Son, uh, you can hear me? So I, it's a pleasure to continue with the uh, Republic of Korea, uh, South Korea, which is, um, of course, another industrialized country with a quite high uh, per capita energy consumption. Uh, with uh, limited land availability as in um, Japan. I think similar landscape also in Japan, many mountains. Um, of course, there is a big also onshore wind potential, but there's also strong focus in Korea on offshore wind. And the Korean government, like the Japanese government, has also um, committed itself to climate neutrality and to phase out uh, um, coal power, but also focus less on nuclear power, which at this point of time still plays a major role. Um, so I would now again ask uh, Professor Son, are you, can you hear me now? Yeah, Professor jung Yul Son is a Pro former professor at Inha University, um, and uh, he is now with the Korean Wind Energy Culture Foundation. Um, before that, he used to be chairman of the Korean Wind Energy Association, and he also used to work with the... Uh -oh. So I don't know why I got suddenly muted. He, uh, professor Son... Um, is, has also been working with the Korean Wind Energy Industry Association, um, one of the people in the past, yeah, I can say decades, who has been working for promoting um, wind power in Korea, but also outside Korea. Um, he's been on the board of the World Wind Energy Association for many years as vice president and is honorary vice president. And now um, I'm asking again, uh, Professor Son, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, yes, Jim. Very good. Okay. So can I hand over to you? Okay. I try to shortly show uh, in Korea situation. It's okay? Yes. Do you have okay. uh, your presentation to share? Uh, uh, I send you my presentation, but I... Okay. Good. It's uh, my presentation. So please go ahead. Yes, I have it ready, Professor Son. Just tell me next when you want to change the slide. Uh, okay, please, uh, next uh, slide. Uh, okay, so Korea is, uh, <clears throat> we have this uh, 
like uh, uh, until last uh, two years ago, so now it's a 10 to 1. So there are not extremely a change of this uh, wind power installation station. Uh, two years ago, we saw uh, 1.5 gigawatt installed um, uh, onshore and offshore. Uh, until last year, is uh, now is uh, uh, our installation capacity is uh, 1.6 uh, gigawatt, including offshore sectors. Next uh, slide, please. Okay, it's not. Uh, since um, uh, uh, three years ago, it's our government announced this uh, renewable energy uh, 3020 implementary plan. That means it's uh, by the year of 2030, 20% 20, uh, 20 of electricity compared to the total national power generation will be supplied as renewable energy. This uh, uh, still now is our government to try to uh, keep these uh, policies uh, but uh, is uh, you know is uh, next year is uh, our uh, uh, presidential uh, election, so we don't know correctly uh, even our uh, policies of now the uh, government uh, continue to uh, next uh, steps. But uh, uh, two weeks ago is uh, our Minister of Commerce and uh, Resource announced us once more is uh, uh, our government tried to expand uh, on the offshore sectors. So not only west uh, side, but also is, uh, east side and the south side. So uh, uh, last uh, year is uh, our government announced this uh, 72, uh, 7.2 gigawatt until uh, 2030. Uh, this plan is uh, continued. And then it's uh, uh, many foreign uh, uh, the, uh, finance, uh, uh, the finance <clears throat> company, they uh, come in Korea and try to invest in uh, the offshore sector because there are a lot of uh, offshore uh, developing in east, uh, east and west side. And otherwise, it's, uh, uh, our government try to deal with the uh, New Deal uh, plans to overcome the economic recession caused by the COVID-19 incident and they respond to the structural transformation. So that means uh, aiming to be carbon neutral, that's uh, transforming the economic base to low carbon and uh, eco-friendly. So nowadays, uh, our government uh, talking about is uh, carbon neutral, is uh, step by step, and then is uh, there are so, uh, some uh, many different plans for the renewable energy sector. Next slide, please. So this table, I think it's, uh, uh, you have seen already. It's, uh, in Korea, we take its uh, RPS system, and then it's, uh, the RPS system so support is, uh, the uh, REC uh, concept. That means it's a uh, renewable energy certificate uh, concept uh, when uh, when someone developed in uh, in Korea uh, uh, offshore wind farm or the onshore wind farm, they can get is, uh, this REC uh, certificate. The onshore sector is uh, is not uh, is one point zero, <clears throat> but in uh, offshore sector is uh, there are uh, different tariffs. Uh, uh, less than five kilometers is uh, two point. And then until 3.5, that is uh, more than 15 kilometers from uh, land. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, uh, uh, yeah, in Korea, uh, now it's uh, only uh, four uh, in. 
in the turbine uh, company, so Tucson and the Hyosung and the Hanjin and the Unison. Next slide, please. So only two companies uh, like uh, Tucson and the Unison, they, uh, they are uh, undergoing to develop is the eight megawatt and the 10 megawatt uh, wind turbine for offshore sectors. Next, step, please. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, yeah, even see it is uh, the, the common score of developing large uh, scale turbine, that means it's uh, uh, not only eight megawatt, but also it's uh, maybe uh, in the uh, in the future, we try to develop the 12 or the 14 megawatt uh, wind turbine size. Mm -hmm. So next step, next slide, please. Mm. <clears throat> uh, so that's just a uh, skip the next slide, please. Uh, so it's also the technologies. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's a uh, cost for the construction and the operation of a domestic wind farm in Korea. Uh, so the wind one operation cost is uh, mainly include maintenance, repair, and parts of power generation facility, and the uh, land usage fees and the insurance fees, uh, something like that. But in Korea, we have some uh, problem. For example, is uh, when onshore uh, sector is uh, there are some many uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, problem, and then is a uh, the some uh, uh, local people they against this uh, offshore and uh, the wind into farm developing. Therefore, is uh, uh, when some company develop the wind farm onshore or offshore. It takes a so uh, long time, not only is, uh, the uh, local uh, permission, but also is, uh, the central uh, permission of government. Next step, please. Oh, this is uh, some <clears throat> uh, wind farm uh, data. Is, uh, next slide, please. So Korea, we uh, we have is uh, RPS system. Uh, I told of uh, before, and then is uh, that is uh, uh, one problem. Is uh, recently the price of RIC has fallen, and acting as a major barrier to securing business viability for wind turbine operators. So uh, we have uh, nowadays a little bit problem with uh, this RIC, uh, uh, RIC prices. But uh, we hope is uh, this um, RIC certificate is uh, uh, already uh, matching for the uh, business, uh, the wind energy business. Uh, I told already uh, for the local conflicts, uh, such as the civil complaint and the difficulties related to local government. But uh, it's, um, since uh, several um, months, our uh, our president Moon uh, talk are uh, talking about this uh, offshore wind energy. That means uh, not only uh, technical technology, but also there are some the employers on the supporting the local economies, something like that. There, uh, therefore, uh, there are. Local complex is uh, a little bit changing for better things. And then uh, here's a uh, civil complaint uh, due to resident acceptance. That is, uh, we need us, uh, uh, we need the resident acceptance to get uh, some admission for developing a uh, wind farm. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, once more, it's RPC related. Is uh, a little bit is, uh, I I think it's uh, you understand it's a RPC system already. So next slide, please. Yeah, uh, 
I, 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 I try to read this uh, in order to aggressively determine and implement the unified target for the spread of wind power, the president uh, directed organization should prioritize the interest between ministers and allow them to be shared and uh, practiced. Secondly, establishment of a standard and a guideline to prevent excess, excessive civil complaints, public relations, efficient education, and the support policies to improve systematic acceptance. That is a very important point for the wind energy sectors. And then uh, secondly, regional conflicts and the difficulties related to local governments. So recently, each local government has restricted the loca location of wind power generation through individual local ordinance and uh, regulation for environmental protection and the prevention of civil complaints. And the location restrictions are intensifying due to the establishment of a regulation on distance that are more than a certain distance from roads and the res residential areas and the projects are suspended due to the student establishment of ordinances in the process of a project promotion. So next slide, please. Oh, so this is our uh, government target. It's a prospect for creating new demand for copper. That means it's, uh, 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 we have some uh, R&D project with the uh, uh, in, uh, international COP organization, and then we uh, we searched how much uh, COP used in COP in the wind uh, wind park in Korea. So this data is some um, calculates in Korea sectors. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So um, now is uh, some small uh, calculations. Uh, prospect for creating new demand for copper that is uh, available uh, uh, in Korea or there are uh, two or three uh, cable company. They also try develop some of special cable for uh, using for uh, offshore sector. And then the under the factors generating copper demand in the wind industry means when we developed some wind turbines like uh, direct drive or some other wind turbine, uh, we need using the uh, copper more than before. Next slide, please. So lastly, so, uh, the mutual growth industry, which grows of the Korean wind power industry, leads to an increase in copper demand. That is only uh, uh, the developing wind turbines using uh, copper sector. Therefore, is uh, especially I uh, 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 to this conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, mm -hmm. indeed, uh, Gidong. It's been mm -hmm. very interesting to hear uh, what's going on in Korea. And again, I would say like uh, uh, um, what we heard from the previous speaker, mm -hmm. um, there is a goal now, which is mm -hmm. uh, carbon neutrality, which can only be achieved with renewable energy, as we know. Mm -hmm. So we are happy to hear that there is ambitions, but of course, we'd like to see a bit more ambition. And mm -hmm. uh, um, of course, hoping that those plans for larger wind farms will soon yeah. become uh, reality in, in terms mm -hmm. of offshore wind. But uh, of course, also be uh, pleased to see more citizen involvement and, and citizen yeah. ownership in, in the Republic of Korea, uh -huh. which can lead to more acceptance, mm -hmm. as we know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it's of course also very interesting to see that the Korean industry has an eye on this and uh, also wants to play a role as a supplier of the equipment. Mm -hmm. 
Um, again, thank you so much. Um, then I would uh, uh, hand over to our next speaker. And it's my pleasure now to welcome uh, Dr. Chami Hossain from India. He's based close to Delhi. Uh, Chami has a long background in renewable energy and wind power as well, going back uh, more than 30 years working for different companies, working for the Indian Wind Energy Association, also working in the um, scientific sector. Uh, right now, uh, Chami is a vice president of the World Wind Energy Association, also chairing the technical committee. And uh, Chami, you are also um, kind of co-host of our World Wind Energy Conference, which will take place in collaboration with the Terry uh, Institute that is based in Delhi in end of November uh, this year. And Chami, a warm welcome to India, and we look forward to hearing how the Indian wind power market um, has been performing in the last year and most recently. Chami, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon or good evening or good morning to all of your uh, participants in the uh, this webinar. Uh, Stephen, can I share my... Uh, Screen? That should be possible, yes. You okay. are a co-host, so please try. That looks good. You just switch to presentation mode and I think they can go ahead. Excellent. Yeah. Just a minute. Yeah, so uh, uh, I'll give some uh, summary of uh, what has been happening in India and uh, 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 how things have happened over the last uh, one year. It was also a period of, uh, you know, lockdowns and COVID. So uh, there has been some slowdown on that account. Uh, So if we uh, look at, uh, you know, the installed capacity today, uh, we may have added something like uh, 1400 to 1500 megawatts of wind power in the year. Uh, we normally go with the financial year. So it is March to March. So by the end of March from last year's March, we may have added something like 1500 megawatts. But if I look at the figures which were available to me till uh, February end, uh, we had something like 39,000 uh, megawatt of total capacity installed uh, in the country. I think India remains uh, the fourth largest uh, uh, country to install uh, wind farms. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, we had some transition uh, uh, which happened over a period of time. Uh, sometime around 2017, uh, uh, there was a switch from feed-in tariff mode to the auctions mode. So if you look at it, the achievements till 2017-18 were mostly from the uh, feed-in tariff uh, mode and something like 34 to 35 gigawatt of the total installed capacity today that we have came from the FIT mode. And the remaining uh, has come from the auctions and the auctions have resulted something like 4,000 uh, megawatt capacity uh, in the main uh, auctions which are uh, conducted by the central government under the ministry which is called the Solar Energy Corporation of India, SECI. And these are known as SECI auctions and uh, they conduct a lot of auctions, uh, large capacity, but some capacity has come up, the other is under build up. Uh, there is uh, this question of uh, whether uh, auctions is a the right kind of mode, though it is in full swing now in India. And uh, some time back, I wrote a paper which was also published in the newsletter of Terry and WWEA uh, on the issues uh, uh, involved and uh, uh, in auctions come feed-in tariff. So my personal opinion is that uh, perhaps a better thing is uh, we didn't tariff. And this is not only for India, but also for the uh, rest of the world because the feed-in tariff mechanism uh, is uh, normally worked out through uh, independent regulators who go into 
this thing uh, deeply and have stakeholder consultation with different stakeholders. And in any policy, there are many issues involved. So the cost and pricing is not the only issue. But having said that, this is my personal opinion and many people uh, might be happy with uh, options as well. There has been a slowdown because uh, uh, in uh, earlier times we used to do even, for example, in uh, uh, 2017, we installed something like 5,000 uh, megawatts of wind power. But uh, currently in this year, we installed something like uh, 1,500 megawatts. One issue is sites. It always takes time to secure lands and uh, uh, you know be ready to implement the project. And all these things uh, can take time. The second is uh, grid connection. So your site must be uh, close to the point of grid connection or uh, reasonably feasible to connect to the grid. And there should be capacity in the grid to take off. And one has to go for approvals with the Power Grid Corporation of India, because if you are going through auctions, you have to connect to the central grid. And there is a certain process that takes time, so things don't happen overnight. So there can be a delay on that front. COVID uh, was uh, a cause of delay, and even the government allowed uh, uh, developers to commission their projects uh, uh, rather late, and they were allowed uh, some uh, flexibility in, uh, in, in this front. So uh, that, that has been one reason for this slowdown. Then uh, when we look at the options, the very low tariffs arrived. Recently, there was a tariff of something like 2.77 rupees per kilowatt hour for a 300 megawatt uh, project achieved in an auction. Now, uh, with this kind of tariff, uh, there are also some cost constraints which come into play in implementation of the project. And uh, uh, this may result in uh, delays or, uh, you know, till the and developers figure out how actually they can achieve their project in such a, a cost framework and also to have some profit for themselves at the end of the day. And many projects uh, must be under implementation, but as of today, I think something like 4,000 megawatt, I will come to it later. Just to give you a, give you a snapshot of uh, India's uh, power scenario, because now renewable energy is a major component in the overall power sector. And recently, our Minister for Renewable Energy, Mr. R. K. Singh, he spoke in the, in the parliament and he said that by 2026 and 27, we will have something like 38,000 uh, megawatt coming in from coal, 27 from gas, 65,000 from hydro, 16.880 megawatt from nuclear. But you see, is a now, the renewable energy is a whopping 2,75,000 or 275,000 megawatts, which also contains solar and wind both. And uh, probably 75 to 100 gigawatt from wind energy. Uh, potential exists in India. I, have, I was myself involved in uh, assessing the potential some about eight, 10 years back. And, uh, and there are other studies also which indicated that India has a vast potential of something like 2000 gigawatt. Uh, but this is more like theoretical than when you come down to, you know, acquiring lands and looking at power, uh, uh, electricity grid and all these things, they're different constraints. And uh, then uh, one has to fine tune this. Uh, so recently, uh, or a few years back rather, Niwe came up with a new number, which was 695. Uh, gigawatt. This is also subject to technology as the wind turbines are becoming larger and the towers are becoming higher. Uh, you can have bigger machines. You, uh, so uh, this is subject to the technology. So uh, one could say it is somewhere between 600 to 1000 gigawatt easily. So that kind of capacity can be set up in India. Then uh, offshore potential also has been evaluated. There are different numbers, but uh, I will stick to the Niwe number, which is around 70 gigawatt of offshore potential that exists and has been identified in India. And uh, this is something that can take off and I will uh, discuss this later. In recent times, there has been interest, uh, a lot of interest in storage systems. Battery is one of them, then electric vehicles, then hydrogen. 
and all these things are then as you are well aware are connected uh, with the renewable energy with wind energy also and has an impact on that new things that have been done under the options are also that uh, uh, the options required that people bid for round the clock power so they will bid they will bid for supplying power uh, in peak time and supplying power in uh, off peak hours and they could bid for different numbers there and also for hybrid power that uh, it will be a combination of solar and wind and uh, you can have it on the same wind farm or you can have different sites with solar and wind and combine the output and uh, give something so this gives some flexibility to developers and uh, uh, these are the things which are happening in india i think in that sense india is quite advanced uh, in looking at uh, uh, renewable energy with solar and wind in totality so uh, Uh, this uh, probably is not happening everywhere so this is an interesting aspect uh, of the indian system yes uh, offshore could be a new beginning and uh, i thought i should just give a little bit of a snapshot of uh, what's happening in offshore you see this is a uh, lidar system which has been installed in the offshore uh, in tamil nadu and Uh, of the of the coast of tamil nadu another which is installed off the coast of uh, gujarat and uh, measurements have been done wind speeds have been found to be uh, reasonably good but not perhaps as good as in the uh, north european uh, areas uh, so uh, this is taking some time because a lot of studies and uh, have to be done on the uh, uh, on the ocean uh, what is called the met ocean and geotechnical kind of Uh, studies and uh, also there are uh, uh, you know these are sub ocean uh, so data availability and data uh, management uh, and various things uh, related to that uh, are important and these are being also uh, looked into but uh, very uh, uh, serious interest uh, from many many players this shows uh, offshore potential and uh, you know wind speed at uh, different areas and as you can see uh, this is gujarat to the west of gujarat uh, you have some sites identified for offshore development and uh, also in the south of tamil nadu and uh, this may take some time uh, to get the approvals and everything in principle approvals as far as i understand have been obtained for uh, something like 5 uh, gigawatt capacity uh, so this can take off and uh, this in fact uh, is a photograph uh, which i picked off from the uh, uh, website of the uh, ministry and it says in, uh, india is blessed with a coastline of about 7600 km which is a very long coastline and uh, this obviously gives us a great potential to uh, harness uh, wind power and a uh, lot of interest from many stakeholders has been there all the worldwide players who are into offshore uh from uk from us uh, from europe denmark they came down to india and uh, they have had discussions uh, uh, with the government so sooner or later something is going to happen this is the way uh, forward for uh, wind energy and uh, i think in the next 10 years something like 5 gigawatt uh, of uh, offshore is possible we uh, looked at the uh, total installed capacity and uh, these are the annual uh, capacity additions uh, which are in uh, uh, year to year uh, capacity additions and this is uh, combined with the growth rate trends as you see the growth rate uh, has gone down of course one reason is that as the capacity increases the growth uh, as a percentage will be less but also uh, in the last uh, for 5 years the trend has been somewhat low the very uh, large options have been done but the projects have to come up so something like 4000 uh, um, megawatts uh, 4000 to 6000 megawatts may have come up within the center and state options uh, as uh, you see i picked up this uh, from the uh, news uh, uh, snippet that uh, very recently which was uh, perhaps in march uh, uh, we achieved uh, something like 2.77 rupees per kilowatt hour for a 300 megawatt which was taken by adana renewable energy 
then another uh, was ayana renewable power which took 300 megawatt uh, in the auction so in total some 1200 megawatt uh, were auctioned within uh, these uh, uh, tariffs uh, and this was the last uh, tranche which happened in march uh so uh, this is the chronology of tariff and uh, the auction capacity uh, we have had auctions uh, from uh, uh, 2017 till march to 2021 and uh, some of them were up to 2000 megawatt and uh, along with that how the tariff has moved we we had very low tariffs also something like 2.44 uh, rupees per kilowatt hour and uh, recently if you see this gray line uh, uh, we achieved something like 2.77 uh, uh, rupees per kilowatt hour and uh, this has implications for the industry it has implications for the manufacturers for all the supply chain and everything and this uh, we had discussed some time earlier so i will not go in any detail but this is the chronology and you can see it's roughly hovering around between 2. uh 5.7 rupees per kilowatt 2.8 rather uh, rupees per kilowatt hour and uh, these are the capacities which were bidded and then allocated so in some places uh, not all the capacities could be allocated but uh, recently i think all was done this is also you know i picked up from a snippet uh, and uh, you see the tariff has changed from 3.46 uh, within the uh, auctions regime to rupees 2.77 which was very recent one minute so uh if you look at it india has added uh, 9.7 gigawatt of power generation capacity from april 2020 to february 2021 is include 3.8 gigawatt of conventional and 5.9 gigawatt of renewable so you can see renewable as you know, the new capacity is far ahead of the conventional capacity and uh, these were uh, things which were recently mentioned by uh, the minister in uh, the parliament so this gives you a i think a fair snapshot of what's happening in india so thank you Yeah, thank you very much, Shami, for I think a very interesting uh, picture uh, about the Indian wind energy and renewable energy and energy market. Um, I mean, aside uh, from of the well-known problems with the auctions, which are indeed not uh, only um, creating some problems in in a market like India, but in all the markets where you had a, a typically smaller, medium-sized investors, it's I think very good to see that the Indian government. has a strong commitment towards renewable energy and wind power in particular uh, i think it's interesting to see that uh, there's been some uh, achievements regarding hybrid systems solar wind hybrid systems and this is of course interesting to see that india has ambitions in terms of offshore wind energy so we all of course curious uh, on how this is continuing and i want to invite take this opportunity to invite everyone again to join us for the 19th world wind energy conference um coming to delhi um well we will decide by the middle of the year whether for pandemic reasons it will be held as an as a hybrid event or in which format exactly but uh, chami maybe you would like to say a few sentences about the conference here as well yeah so uh, uh wwea and te together uh, plan to do a uh, event uh, in november uh, Uh, around 24th november uh, uh, this was a, supposed to be a world wind energy uh, conference and uh, we have done lot of ground work uh, towards that but uh, uh, all the planning was done when the pandemic was going down but uh, very recently uh, in fact in february it almost uh, uh, died down totally the pandemic but uh, very recently there is a new wave and uh, this second wave is rising very rapidly and uh, we have to take a call and we have to uh, see what is uh, possible we will be examining uh, these things so uh, what is definitely possible and what will happen definitely is that the conference will be held so either it can be in a hybrid mode or that is some physical presence and uh, 
uh, with a uh, presence online or it can be totally online or it can be totally physical and uh, of course online as well so uh, these things we will uh, take a decision and in the meantime we have lot of interest uh, in the conference and many people have submitted their abstracts papers and things like that and all that work is happening yes, thank you indeed. thank you stephen we're meeting on a on a weekly basis to discuss yeah. uh, the preparations yeah. of this event yeah. which will be of course much broader even than this conference at uh, this uh, event here because not only talking about market developments but also about technology and about wind and sun the theme of the conference is going to be powering the world with wind and sun so i think that reflects indeed what the world needs to do so chami thank you very much once again and have a nice a good afternoon uh, then I have the Thank pleasure you. to travel to the next, or virtually we travel to the next country as at a time when we cannot travel in, in, in the real life. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Sishan Ashfaq from Pakistan, uh, India's neighbor country, um, which is also a, a very interesting market for wind power and per Okay, somehow I'll get muted from time to time. Personally, I visited Pakistan for the first time in uh, early 2004, together, uh, by the way, with uh, Preben Megard, our founding president, who passed away um, just very recently. And we were on our way to China to prepare the first World Wind Energy Conference that we held in China, together with our Chinese colleagues. And on the way there, we uh, had uh, several days in Pakistan and from that time uh, we started working with our Pakistani colleagues and now it's my pleasure to welcome Sishan who used to work for WWEA um, for several years. He's doing some work still for WWEA, work, uh, coordinating uh, what we're doing there but now he has uh, moved to um, a company, a developer, the German company Sovitec. Um, Sishan, you are now the Managing Director for Pakistan of Sovitec and now it's my pleasure to welcome you and you will share with us latest information about Pakistan. Thank you uh, very much, Stefan, for having me. Uh, as you have mentioned, I'm currently working for Sovitec in Pakistan, but I have uh, a long association with the World Wind Energy Association and you know I'm also uh, currently advising the association in you know, different activities, including the ones in Pakistan. So here I will uh, be talking about the wind uh, power market status in Pakistan, uh, the market which is uh, quite small compared to the other markets that have been presented before my presentation. So I will be talking about uh, the power sector overview and uh, the wind uh, power installation status and uh, the future trend uh, and the outlook of uh, wind power in Pakistan uh, very briefly. So starting uh, starting off with uh, the power sector, uh, you know, the total installed capacity is roughly around 335,000 uh, megawatts to 36,000 megawatts. And, uh, you know, it's largely dominated by thermal power generation, which uh, represents around 61% of uh, the generation mix in Pakistan, which is followed by hydropower, which is stands uh, around 30%, and then uh, comes nuclear power, uh, uh, renewables, and uh, in the end, it is nuclear power. So renewables uh, only represent around, uh, you know, 6% of the total generation uh, mix in Pakistan, which in my opinion is... Uh, a quite uh, poor state of affairs, uh, you know, if we look at uh, the potential that we have uh, in our country. So talking about uh, wind resource availability, you know, the theoretical potential uh, stands at around 346 gigawatt. And, uh, you know, most of the resource rich area are either in South of the country are, you know, towards uh, Iran border, uh, which is uh, southern western part of the country. And uh, the biggest uh, wind corridor, which is located in Sindh, uh, that uh, lawn holds a wind potential of around 60 gigawatt. Uh, 
and uh, the economically viable potential stands at around you know 11 to 15000 uh, megawatts and so far we have only tapped around 10 uh, percent of that potential within the gym uh, gympir uh, corridor only and you know all the operational projects are either in gympir or garo which is the same uh, wind corridor uh, when we talk about the install capacity uh, you know uh, currently we have the 1237 uh, megawatt of wind uh, power projects installed in the country the first renewable energy policy was announced back in 2006 and it took at least seven years for the country to install its you know first wind power project back in 2013 and currently there are around 610 megawatts of uh, you know projects that are under construction and they are expected to become online either during uh, the last quarter of 2021 or uh, first quarter of 2022. And all these projects are being uh, developed under, you know, cost plus regime. Uh, looking at uh, uh, the price trends, you know, when uh, the market started taking shape, the first tariff that was announced back in 2011 was 14.66 US cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, uh, the projects that are under construction are, have a tariff of 4.1 US cents per uh, kilowatt hour. And uh, we see a reduction of around 70%, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, tariff reduction, uh, if we compare, the year 2011 to uh, 2018. Uh, this trend is, uh, you know, in line with the global trends. In fact, if when we talk about wind power, it has already outpaced and outperformed the global trends. You know, in solar, we have uh, seen such, uh, you know, dramatic reductions in, uh, you know, tariff, but for wind, it is uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, strange what has happened in Pakistan and, you know, the, the current projects that have been given tariff by the national regulator uh, is 3.25 on average. But, uh, you know, these project developers have applied for review petition because they don't find projects, you know, economically feasible uh, at this tariff with a 50 megawatt size project. Uh, you know, similar things have happened. If we talk about the technology costs, we have seen a reduction of around 60% uh, in last 10 years, which is uh, quite uh, remarkable uh, in this part of the world. Uh, talking about uh, the market share of different OEMs, uh, G is currently the market leader, which is followed by Goldwind and uh, then uh, Nordex and then Siemens, Gamesa, Vestas and Mingyang, they share 50 megawatt each. And uh, when we talk about under construction uh, wind power projects, you know, Siemens, Gamesa uh, is leading at that front followed by Goldwind and uh, General Electric. So for the future, uh, power generation, you know, from wind power, the the government of Pakistan has uh, already approved a renewable energy policy, uh, which sets a target to achieve 20% share of renewables by 2025 and 30% by 2013, the total generation mix of Pakistan and uh, the indicative generation capacity expansion plan, which uh, basically provides the yearly capacity addition of different technologies, uh, you know, outlines around 8 gigawatt of wind and uh, 12 gigawatt of solar to be installed by, uh, by the year 2030, which is, uh, you know, quite promising. Uh, even if half of that target is achieved, you know, we'll see a huge number of uh, installations in, in Pakistan uh, if when we talk about you know wind and uh, solar power, currently you know there are certain drivers that will basically 
expedite the growth of wind power in Pakistan. Certain barriers as well, they which are confining the growth. So, uh, starting off with barriers, uh, first and the foremost one is the least cost option. As I've already mentioned, that uh, the tariff uh, that was uh, given to around four or five wind developers a year ago is uh, on average 3.5 US cents, which is the lowest uh, tariff that has been given to any technology in Pakistan. So, you know, that. Uh, lease cost option will push uh, the installation of wind energy in the future. And then, you know, uh, the government has uh, decided uh, to reduce its dependency on imported fuels. Uh, currently, uh, the country imports around uh, 15 to 16 billion of, uh, you know, uh, US uh, billion. Uh, uh, the total import bill uh, for Oil is around uh, 12, uh, 15 to 14 billion US dollars, which uh, the government wants to reduce. And, you know, renewables uh, provide a very good alternative for that. Uh, you know, similarly, uh, around 30 to 40 percent of the gas demand is also imported uh, through RLNG, which has to be reduced as well. And uh, the third driver is the availability of a very good resource as. Uh, I uh, showed you the map uh, that uh, uh, the southern and southern western part of the country uh, hold very good wind potential, and we uh, might see you know uh, future wind installations in Balochistan, uh, where we find even better potential than the one we uh, than the Sindh province. And another driver is the replacement of inefficient uh, thermal projects and also captive power projects. So these captive power projects are run on natural gas, but they are uh, not that efficient and the government wants to uh, use that uh, natural resource for other activities. And, you know, captive power projects using natural gas are around three to five or uh, four gigawatt. So if, uh, uh, the government replaces uh, these uh, projects or retire, uh, ask these projects to shut down. The, the only natural option would be to switch towards renewables. And in fact, the government has already stopped supplying uh, you know, natural gas to uh, most of the captive power uh, plants. And similarly, you know, we will see around two to three gigawatt of uh, thermal uh, power generation retiring in the next three, four years. Uh, that is mainly owned by the government itself. Talking about the barriers uh, that uh, might slow down the growth of wind power in Pakistan, uh, uh, the first one is the surplus capacity, which the government believes that we are already in a, in a kind of surplus capacity, which uh, in my opinion is an absurd argument and I don't really buy that because currently around uh, 36, uh, sorry, 27 percent of the population is not connected to the national grid and uh, the per capita consumption is uh, just over 500 uh, uh, kilowatt hour per person per year, which is among the lowest in the world. So. Uh, I don't see it as a barrier. In fact, the government needs to, uh, you know, extend uh, its grid and also enhance uh, uh, the utilization of electricity uh, for different segments of the society. Uh, you know, I believe uh, the people of uh, uh, Pakistan deserve a better usage of, uh, you know, electricity in the country. And then there is... Uh, Another barrier that uh, may create uh, a bottleneck for future renewable energy expansion, that is uh, the coal pipeline. Around uh, six uh, gigawatt of uh, coal power projects are in pipeline. The government has already retired around uh, 3.5 gigawatt of coal power projects, but uh, you know it has to basically stop developing uh, further coal projects if it is serious uh, to install uh, wind and solar projects in the future. And another uh, issue 
is uh, of uh, you know not so developed grid because uh, the projects that are already connected to the grid uh, complain about forced shutdowns and continuous interruptions so government must ensure uh, you know a smooth grid development plan for uh, you know a future integration of wind and solar and then we have uh, experienced some policy and regulatory delays which have caused uh, 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 project delays uh, in the past and you know we expect uh, similar things happening in the future and uh, then uh, there is an off taker risk because uh, the financial health of uh, uh, central power purchasing agency which is the sole uh, power purchaser on government's behalf in pakistan uh, you know is currently going through a difficult time because of the circular debt and uh, that might uh, present a barrier in the future for a renewable energy product induction as well so that's it from my side if uh, you know if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer thank you yeah, thank you very much, Sishan. That was very good to hear from you first-hand information about Pakistan. And uh, of course, there are some downsides as well. But I think in general, it's good to see that uh, Pakistan also has taken wind power as a serious option to generate, uh, in particular at low cost. And the cost reduction in the feed-in tariff, I think, have been impressive indeed, the achievements there. Um, of course, we know that the situation is a bit similar, like in India, the uh, government planning to switch to auctions, which uh, hopefully will not uh, be as detrimental as as that uh, as there is a, a very now vibrant uh, um, sector of medium-sized companies which have been investing in the Pakistan wind power sector, so that uh, Pakistan can use this abundance of domestic uh, cheap wind power for its development and for the, the benefits of its population. Um, thank you so much with this. Uh, we would uh, again continue our virtual journey, um, travel more to the north. And uh, now um, we would uh, uh, go to visit Russia. And it's my pleasure to welcome Evgeny Nikolaev. Evgeny, great to see you. Um, of course, Russia is by far the largest country of the world in terms of the land size. Uh, naturally, automatically also has the largest wind resources. And uh, Russia or the Soviet Union was actually the first which made use of it on a large scale. So in the 1950s and 60s, there was still a wind industry and thousands of wind turbines. But then um, it all stopped. But I think the good news you have is that more recently there's been uh, a turnaround and we have now some wind farms in Russia. Uh, Yevgeny, welcome and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll uh, show the screen. So um, my name is Evgeny. I'm uh, I'm from Russia, and uh, today today I'm I'll be talking about Russian wind market. So uh, the background to this is that it's the um, obviously in 2015, uh, 175 nations, including us and in, uh, uh, including Russia, Kazakhstan, signed the Paris Treaty Agreement, um, which uh, to be fair. Uh, didn't uh, affect uh, that much energy sector so far uh, in Russia or any other um, sector in Russia that much, I would say. Um, but still, uh, there was a movement toward um, kind of creating some green energy, green technologies. Uh, at that period, uh, like early, significantly earlier than that, was uh, the idea of uh, like waking up of a green giant. So Russia can become one green giant. Obviously, from listening from what today uh, uh, people were saying about uh, uh, all around the world uh, activities, we can say uh, that it's not uh, uh, not even close to that. I'll uh, mention, but still, uh, since 2016, 2013, uh, there, there is a significant shift, obviously, as well in terms of volumes. Um, it's simpler to grow from zero, obviously. Uh, so 
we'll uh, uh, go through the slides uh, uh, and I will explain more. Um, we have an auction systems as well as uh, some other countries uh, which we're presenting today. So wind energy um, on the last uh, auctions um, uh, which were held um, I think earlier, definitely last year, the ones which were taken last year were significantly by far the cheapest source of energy available in the country under those on the paper, let's call it like that. Uh, by far, even uh, gas, new gas uh, turbines, uh, uh, inclu including that uh, in Russia we have um, probably not the most expensive gas, but uh, cheapest gas possible, uh, natural gas, I mean, still uh, by far, it's, uh, it's the best, uh, best opportunity for creating new generating capacity. Uh, by saying that, I can uh, tell that um, we by far much better than uh, by cost-wise uh, from from nuclear. And uh, at one point, that was a kind of a, an idea with stability and all, all of that, and of the grid uh, acceptability. Potentially, this might become a problem um, if we go above 10% uh, uh, level of installed capacity. Russia at the moment has... Uh, 220-ish uh, gigawatt of installed capacity uh, throughout the um, uh, throughout the energy system. So, um, and um, uh, we will see uh, later that uh, we are not reaching a half percent yet. Uh, so, we in the process of uh, of kind of ac accepting the technology. Let's call it like that. And. Uh, uh, it still need to show substantial growth um, to reach um, anywhere to to have uh, that kind of grid co co um, computability issues. But still, uh, government support uh, um, for renewable energy looks um, significantly different from the ones uh, um, which are looking in um, uh, in, in a feeding tariff or anything else, uh, we are capex based refunds and uh, tenders already passed through. So we are speaking uh, roughly now on um, the whole uh, uh, capacity is sold out. So uh, till 2024, we should see uh, significant growth uh, in installed capacity in realizing projects um, together with. Um, together with government um, i personally was involved in um, um, correcting or um, um, accepting the recommendation not accepting but uh, offering the recommendations how to uh, get this market going and it uh, seems like uh, our work uh, didn't go uh, in vain and uh, so the tenders went through all those decrees are um, described here are used uh, for this particular reason um, they just uh, define how it works in in Russia. So um, the capacity so far uh, in from 2018 uh, increased um, five uh, five point three times um, above five five times more than uh, in total. Yeah. So and but we are not yet reaching one gigawatt of total installed capacity, uh, which is, uh, um, as I'm already told, less than um, a percent, I mean, just over three percent of uh, total installed capacity of uh, Russia in terms of energy, energy generation. Um, and, uh, but still it's a, a significant improvement uh, from what it was like, um, say five years ago, uh, when uh, in five years we had like uh, around uh, 30, Three zero uh, of installed capacity. Now it's nine hundred by the end of twenty twenty. Uh, it's still untapped uh, potential. Um, obviously, the defined systems of uh, of uh, countries like Russia, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. Uh, we are speaking about uh, five to six. Um, yeah, five to six gigawatt uh, of uh, projects and. Uh, estimated uh, market size from 10 to 10, uh, from five, uh, from seven to 10 billion uh, euros uh, yet untapped 
uh, we uh, but though have uh, some good uh, movements toward uh, towards a kind of uh, a Russian support system uh, it's in uh, in very deep discussions about what would be next uh, after 2024 by 2024 we should um, become um, as a free three gigawatt plus country uh, so in that way uh, um, Russia will uh, uh, will come into one percent uh, range uh, of uh, whole installed capacity uh, in um, in the country of electricity. Thank you very much for for your attention. Uh, be ready to answer the questions. Thanks so much, Yevgeny. Uh, and by the way, I of course when I introduced you, I did not mention that you are representing Russia on the board of the World Wind Energy Association. Thank you for your contributions in this regard. And uh, of course, you are also um, kind of uh, part of the business. So with your company, Russia Wind, uh, right. we wish you, of course, a lot of success for that work. And it's really great to see that De Russia is now back on the world map. We shouldn't say has appeared, but it's back on the map of wind power, of the world wind power map. Um, and of course, what we see now, uh, a three, uh, bit more, over three gigawatt capacity in 2024, sounds small compared to the size of the country and the like we look at the chinese numbers but i think it's very important that china uh, that russia has started and we're very confident that uh, once this technology and and people technicians engineers are again familiar with it uh, there will be a, a much faster development in russia as well also considering the the role russia has as an exporter of uh, energy resources which uh, for obvious reasons will not continue based on fossil resources, but wind power could kind of compensate for that and could become a new export product or products made from wind power. So again, uh, thank you so much, um, Yevgeny. Um, we would then, um, and just maybe lastly, let me mention that we published recently a study of the Russian wind power market together with the Friedrich Hebert Foundation, where we analyzed in depth the latest developments in the barriers at the prospects. So if you have an interest in that, please uh, visit the WWEA website um, that was published in March. You'll find the announcement there. Now, great pleasure to welcome our next speaker. Our journey now continues again more to the south, um, Israel. And uh, my great pleasure to welcome uh, Gadi Hareli. Gadi, you are the CEO of the Israel Wind Energy Association. Um, an organization which is also a member of the World Wind Energy Association. You also served uh, on our board. You're still on the board of the World Wind Energy Association. And we look forward to hearing from you about the latest developments of wind power in Israel. Gadi. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for the kind words. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll have this 10 minutes describe uh, what's going on uh, here in Israel. Uh, I'm also actively involved uh, with uh, the Ministry of Energy here, working with them. Uh, so, uh, uh, and you can see here on the uh, first slide some of uh, uh, the installations uh, currently available, uh, wind, uh, solar, uh, different types of CSPs, uh, concentrated solar power plants, uh, and so on. So, uh, uh, Israel, unlike R Russia, is a tiny country, uh, shrinking by the, by the minute. Uh, it has a peak demand of 13.8 gigawatts, uh, with an installed capacity of 17 gigawatts uh, for electricity generation. Um, the IEC, which is the Israeli electric company, is uh, practically used to be uh, the sole and the only uh, organization in charge of uh, both uh, uh, production, uh, transmission, and distribution. Uh, uh, its current capacity is uh, 11.6 gigawatts uh, with uh, 15 power stations. 
the, the regulatory framework uh, which has uh, is changing with time is splitting uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, mandate of the IC so they are uh, now uh, not producing cannot produce uh, renewables uh, and uh, uh, also the management of the the system the electric grid is also uh, going to be uh, extracted uh, uh, out of their hands so they will be in charge of transmission and distribution only um uh, the yearly power consumption of the country, uh, electricity consumption is at, uh, standing at the roughly 70 tera hour per year. Uh, I mentioned the electricity market reform, which is going now, and we are having different projects of uh, uh, attempting um, uh, different mechanisms for uh, resolving di different issues, some of which relate to renewable energy as well. Uh, all the topics of uh, pick shaving and uh, uh, pickers for generation and aggregation of uh, consumers uh, to stabilize uh, the electric grid. So uh, a lot of interesting research projects which are taking place uh, related to the electricity grid as well as developments of technologies, uh, some of which we may uh, touch a bit later if we have the time. Uh, uh, and which uh, relate directly to the uh, integration of renewable energy uh, generation into the grid. Um, uh, so we'll see about that later. Um, currently, what we have at this stage, we have 7% uh, of the uh, production in the country uh, coming from renewable. Uh, most of that is uh, originating uh, from solar, uh, out of which most of it is uh, photovoltaics. Uh, we have 65% coming from natural uh, gas uh, and 28%, roughly 28 coming from coal, which is to be uh, to, to fade out by 2026. Uh, we had the target of reaching 10% by uh, 2020. Uh, we didn't get to this target. As you see, we are only currently at 7% of renewable energy. We expect uh, to reach the 10% goal uh, this year. Um, uh, yeah. But in any case, uh, the, the new target for 2030 is 30% uh, of uh, renewable energy. Uh, you can see here some uh, graphs which I didn't manage to, didn't have the time to translate uh, into English, but this one is uh, uh, showing the energy. So this is uh, terawatt hours uh, from renewables uh, by the end of 2019. And this is the installed uh, capacity uh, of renewables uh, totaling 2.3 gigawatts by the end of 2019. As you can see here, uh, most of it is originating from photovoltaics, uh, 70, 70, 77%. Uh, then there is a CSP uh, uh, installation, followed by uh, biogas, hydro, biomass, uh, and only 1% uh, coming from wind at the end of 2019. Here at the bottom, you can see a, a graph of the plans of the reduction uh, uh, according to the plans. We can skip that. Okay, so uh, since most of the installations are coming from photovoltaics, this is a graph showing the progress done in the Israeli PV installations, including uh, 2020. Uh, so we are currently at the stage in which we have roughly 2.5 gigawatts uh, of photovoltaics uh, installed capacity. Um, and since we are not Russia, so uh, Israel with a limited uh, land uh, availability, uh, 
a pretty big share of the installations are uh, rooftop installations. So one uh, gigawatt of the 2.5 gigawatts are uh, uh, rooftop in installations. Uh, and most of the ground, uh, ground installations are in the southern part of Israel in, in the desert. Uh, on top of that, there are also these uh, CSP power plants, uh, which are originally Israeli technologies, and that is probably the reason they got the permit and the push forward to, to do the installation. But as you well know, probably, uh, these technologies find it hard, hard to compete with the, the classical photovoltaic uh, panels. Um, Next, uh, we go to uh, wind farms in Israel. So uh, uh, I heard in previous lectures that uh, they talked about installed capacity, not necessarily a co grid connected capacity. So, uh, so we have this uh, wind farm in uh, Emek Abacha in the northern part of Israel uh, over here. Uh, and uh, another one in the northern part of Israel, Bereshit uh, uh, wind farm. Uh, you can see here some already uh, operational grid connected wind farms in uh, Sirin and Gilboa. Uh, by the way, next to it, this over here, large water reservoir is a 300 megawatt. Uh, pump storage uh, installation for pig shaving. Uh, we have three such uh, 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 hydroelectric uh, power plants for uh, energy storage. Um, going directly into the, the installed capacity and what are the projects uh, specifically, so we have a very old wind farm, uh, May Golan, uh, in the location of Tel Asania, uh, with a six megawatt of very old turbines, Austrian brand, uh, ten, 10 such turbines of 600 kilowatts. There are a few 200 uh, kilowatt installations as well from this, the early, uh, in the region of 1993. Uh, then we have in 2016, when we had the World Wind Energy Conference here in Jerusalem, I was expecting these wind farms to uh, get grid connected by 2015, which were they were already installed, but didn't get the permit for uh, the connection or were not connected yet. Nowadays, uh, they are fully operational. Uh, the, uh, both are owned by a, a company named Afcon. Uh, one in Maale Gilboa, in one in Sirin, 11.9, 935, 14 plus 11 turbines. Uh, the brand, the, these are Gamesa uh, uh, turbines. And the reason that they installed in 2016 only 850 uh, kilowatt machines is the fact that the permit was for a certain height and a specific turbine, and they didn't want to take the chance or the risk of attempting uh, to modify the, the permit. So that is the reason why they uh, kept uh, these types of turbines. Uh, a production line had to be revived in order to provide these turbines in 2016. And now we are actually coming to the new era. Uh, uh, and the first uh, wind farm is a 109 megawatt uh, wind farm. Uh, of 34 uh, wind turbines, each of 3.2 uh, megawatt, uh, which is already there. Uh, they are already doing tests uh, for the connection, and it's expected to uh, to be completely grid co connected and operational in a month or two. Uh, so that can certainly be considered as uh, an existing and uh, working project. Uh, uh, Enlight, as you can see here, has some more projects uh, down the road. Uh, then there is the company named Energix, 
uh, again in, in the Golan with a capacity of 110 megawatts uh, with 31 turbines of 3.6 megawatt each, uh, which should come uh, should be grid connected uh, next year. Um, uh, maybe the order is not exact here. Uh, the reason I put it down here is because with these two uh, developers I didn't have the chance of speaking with, so I was not sure about the estimated uh, connection dates. Uh, I, so my assumption is it would be 22, 23. Uh, another two projects from Enlight. This is uh, so far the biggest one. You saw some pictures from the construction of the foundations of these turbines. Uh, so 39 turbines, uh, I'm not sure, they, they are not sure yet which, uh, which vendor and which type of turbine would be used. So I simply put an average number over here. Uh, by the way, most of them which, with whom I talk, seems like GE would be uh, a favorable uh, uh, vendor here, uh, but there are discussions with other vendors as well. Um, so this is the Bereshit, which is also in the northern part of the country. Um, then another project of Enlight of 40 megawatts uh, is planned to be in the region of roughly Beersheba, the southern part of Israel, Yatir, uh, that's uh, close to a forest, which is stopping the uh, uh, the penetration of uh, of the desert uh, to, to prevent uh, desertification. So that's another interesting story about sustainability, but we are in wind energy topics now. Uh, EDF has a branch in Israel, EDF Israel, who is, uh, has been working on a few projects, seems like two or three are going to mature, uh, totaling in the range of 80 megawatts. Um, with 16 turbines uh, expected to uh, be connected next year or in 2023. And the last uh, perhaps significant one is uh, Zodiac uh, in the Galil region uh, with a power of 32 megawatts. Uh, all these uh, installations are based on uh, a given uh, feeding tariff uh, thing, which uh, is allocated uh, for uh, 730 megawatts. So we have uh, the permits, I would say, uh, assumed permits for uh, nearly 600 of the 730 uh, available megawatts. megawatts. Uh, this is the feeding tariff is uh, for 20 years and roughly uh, in the range of uh, 10. Uh, US cents uh, per, per kilowatt hour, obviously. Uh, now, from uh, part of my activity uh, relates to uh, to uh, address uh, uh, things which uh, don't uh, 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 or stop the progress of uh, installations of renewables. Uh, so, from my discussions with the different uh, developers. I'm not sure how it is in your countries, but roughly 50% uh, of the developed uh, wind farms do not get the permit for different reasons, uh, be it uh, noise, shadow, uh, flicker, uh, birds, uh, mortality, uh, etc. Uh, out of the 50% which do continue uh, on working for the permits, uh, roughly, and if, even if they do get a permit, roughly 60 to 70% of the turbines are disqualified for the same reasons. Uh, so this is basically uh, my evaluation of the statistics from what, uh, what I hear and see locally. Um, 
So uh, now there are trends uh, in Israel. We're working on different things. Uh, currently, there is a work I was participating in looking into the possibility of doing uh, offshore installations uh, in Israel. Uh, with current plans for the offshore uh, usage. Uh, there is currently a big bid uh, related to uh, uh, dual use of land due to the uh, size of the country. So uh, land usage is, uh, the dual use is uh, vital. So we have different activities relating to floating PV, agro integrated PV, and uh, many projects of integrated storage. By the way, I heard someone else speaking about that. So uh, there is a project uh, I'm involved in which uh, uh, supports transformation, mobile uh, transformation of storage uh, between uh, sites. Uh, so you have the wind farm in one location, you charge these uh, uh, cabins and then you move them to the connection point. Uh, so uh, a lot of activities, different activities, very currently very low in the total amount and uh, in the percentage, uh, and uh, that's about it. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Gadi, for uh, giving us a, a very good idea of where Israel stands in terms of. Uh, um, renewable energy, in particular wind power. And it's good to see that uh, there are some major wind farms obviously under construction now. So we can expect some more wind farms um, um, getting online in the next one, two years. Uh, that is, of course, very encouraging. Um, we have a question here from Ulrich Hogen Hogenhaven. I assume that's our colleague from uh, a small wind manufacturer, Viking Wind. Um, what are the latest regulations for small wind in Israel? Okay, uh, so small wind, there is an allocation uh, of, if I recall correctly, uh, 20 megawatts for small wind with this pretty good feed-in tariff. I've been trying and attempting to uh, make it financially viable, but with given all the constraints and the need to connect to uh, uh, to the grid uh, where there is no connection uh, or not uh, no installation of existing uh, photovoltaics for example it was pretty much pretty difficult there were many attempts by many uh, developers but none of them really matured i mean i had some installations of turbine here turbine there but nothing significant despite the attractive uh, field tariff, sorry. Then what is the main barrier? The ma uh, first of all, uh, uh, regulatory wise, uh, once you are talking about more than 50 kilowatt, that is considered similar to a uh, large size wind turbines. Some of the developers which were shown uh, on, the pre on the slides, started with small wind turbines but the expenses of millions of dollars in the process of development and the years that it takes uh, it doesn't cover the expenses of the development itself let alone the so that is the main reason so either you could you had the financial back, backup to 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 go for a large wind otherwise you would have to go through the nearly all the bureaucracy unless you're talking about 50 15 kilowatt that's kind of barrier and not mm -hmm. more than nine turbines so the limit the sizing limitation and the amount of efforts the regulatory efforts you have to go through uh, that's made it roughly uh, no go so it's for really small turbines in the kilowatt range you would still have a big bureaucratic um effort to... no for example there is a, a certain limit up to which uh, uh, let's say up to four meters for example if you have in, there are uh, you have to go into the details so very very tiny wind turbines shouldn't be much of a problem but then 
the maintenance of very small wind turbines and the amount of income you make out of it, it's next to the ground, so the wind speed would not be that attractive and the whole financials wouldn't make sense. Well, um, Gadi, I assume that that is a little bit beyond the main topic of this uh, meeting here. And uh, of course, we also have webinars dedicated for small wind. Maybe we can also have one where you also present that a bit more in depth, because I think now uh, having that discussion for small wind is certainly worthwhile. But uh, as we are now coming uh, to the end of the first part of our world market development overview, uh, I would say thank you for now. And uh, there's no more question here. So a great thank you to Israel. And uh, we hope to hear more good news from you in the near future about the next wind farm that's going to be grid connected. Yeah, then uh, let you. me say thank you uh, again to all the speakers. I think we had really uh, some very good news from some countries. We had, uh, I, I think, positive developments from, we heard positive developments from everywhere. Now um, we will have a, well, as it is now, 84 minutes break um, uh, in which you may uh, take a rest, you may recover, you may, of course, continue some other work. We will meet exactly here again uh, well, in, in European summertime, it's going to be 13.30, uh, 84 minutes, as I said, from now. And we will continue with the first speaker, uh, Tanay Giuya from Turkey, then followed by Carlo Ricca from Germany, Italy. Then we will have several African countries, Egypt, Morocco, some sub-Sahara Africa, uh, and then Brazil, Argentina, and last but certainly not least, USA and Canada. So I wish you a good break. Uh, take your break. And I hope to see you all again in now 83 minutes.